So we're talking Pink Floyd, The Wall. So yes. give me the give me the goods on this. This is the the greatest concept album of all time. This is like what made concept albums a thing. And and yeah. so many bands of we have another concept album coming up uh, in, in your top five. Uh, why why The Wall? They Pink Floyd has in a span of just four albums. They they put out The Wall. They put out Dark Side of the Moon and they put out Wish You Were Here, which is in my top three albums of all time. That's three out of four album span is three of the all time greats. Why does The Wall stand out to you? I think, you know, I think it was just always in my house, you know, growing up The Wall, those songs were, um, you know, I was born in Wales, of course, in Cardiff, Wales. Just the that album is just so British, you know, from the little sound bites in between the accents um, and the skits. Yeah. Yeah. The little skits just probably that record for me is the least um, like drum record for me. It's just about putting it on from start to finish. It's, it's the experience. And it wasn't, I didn't really understand the story of the wall till years later. Um, like there's another record we're going to talk about coming up where I kind of knew the storyline more as far as um the records like that that have a storyline but um it, it's just song to song it, i could have the wall playing all the time in the background and just in in repeat and it never ever gets old they're the most classic songs um i don't know i don't know what what i could say about it that people just don't know it's the wall i mean it's it's perfect that album is absolutely perfect in every way um it sets such a a tone, you know, it, any, I could be driving, I could be working, dr- anything I'm doing in the day, if that album's in the background, it, the day just seems to fly by, you know, it's, and everything is so familiar to me, every single song. Um, and it's just, you know, it's like that song in the, when you're in the shower, you know, it's the wall, I could sing full blast to everything. It's just the perfect record to me, you know, where we were talking about um, Fleetwood Mac, rumors that's like the relationship album that this t- the wall is to me just like the driving you know in in your car on your cassette tape that's what it always was to me it was always there um and it really taught me a lot about you know like i was saying everything except drums i was never really listening as a drummer to the wall of just listening to the songwriting uh to the lyrics just really to the production you know uh just that album really taught me a lot about the the ambiance of, of how to make a record, um, the message of a record, and like the colors of a record. You know, it wasn't uh, so much about the, the articulation about one's playing. I mean, of course, if you're a guitar player, that that's the album you want to learn, you know, every guitar solo from. But as a drummer, it wasn't so much that for me. Not to say that it's not incredible in that way, but it, it's just the it's the full picture, you know, it's like put, it's a movie, you know, every time, literally it's a movie. Um, I can still put on the wall. I, I love showing like, for example, my kids, I, I put on the wall recently and I just kind of watched their reaction to it. And those little sound bites in between, you know, if you, if you can't eat your pudding, you know, all that stuff. I see Roman reacting to that stuff. Like his ears perk up. Doesn't really know what he's hearing yet, but I remember being that age and hearing those sound bites. Um, so yeah, it just feels so very British to me being a British kid. It's like that just needs to be in my list of, of the top five records. Cause it was always there. It just reminds me of home. It reminds me of my family. It reminds me of me being in my living room as a kid, you know, it's all that stuff, but and it's still, it sounds so fucking good, you know? Yeah. I, mean, I don't know what I can say about the wall. It's the wall, man. It's yeah, perfect. It, it featured like two of the most iconic songs of all time with another brick in the wall part two and with comfortably numb. And of course. You're, you're talking about, you know, the tasty guitar stuff that's on there. Um, what's funny is my two favorite guitar solos of all time, uh, it's two of the bands we've mentioned. So Metallica, but on a different album on the black album, uh, the unforgiven. So that's one of my two right. favorite guitars. Just the vibe is amazing. And then yeah. comfortably numb, the guitar solo and comfortably numb is probably my all time favorite guitar solo. There's like two different guitar solos in that song. And, uh, the two combined, but especially the second part, it just like mm-hmm. takes these notes up into like, 
space territory, just these, sure. these high otherworldly notes that are like from another universe or from the future. Uh, so that that's what one of the things that stands out to me is, man, the guitar work, David Gilmore. I love that. It, it takes it into space territory. That That's the quote right there of the interview. I, like, I wish it was mine, but it was yours. Yeah. It takes yeah, it into yeah. space territory. Dude, cool. so so good. Uh, I'm not going to lie. So I went back and listened to your five favorite albums to make sure that I knew them inside and out. And I listened to the first four. And when I got to the wall, I knew I had to do this. I'm not going to lie. I had a little weed gummy and then I listened to this album because I wanted okay. to get taken into the spectacle that is the double album, The Wall. Um, one thing that I learned years ago that I don't know if many people know this, and I was shocked to learn this, uh, <clears throat> A double album. So albums like Pink Floyd's The Wall or um, Smashing Pumpkins, uh, me uh, Melancholy, Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness, double albums. I did not know this, but certifications for double albums, they're doubled. So for example, um, the Smashing Pumpkins double album was certified diamond, which is 10 million copies sold, but it's actually 5 million and mm -hmm. because it's two discs, it's considered having sold two albums or two discs. Ah, so when you hear a double album that gets a certification, so um, let's say Red Hot Chili Peppers, Stadium Arcadium, double album went platinum. It actually sold 500,000 copies, but there's two discs in each one. I see. So I never knew that. That, that, was, uh, that caught me off guard when I learned that years ago. So Pink Floyd's The Wall uh, sold over 30 million copies. Uh, making it the best-selling double album of all time. But as an insider, I know that's 15 million copies of The Wall sold that includes two discs that are each counted towards certification. So dropping some random nerdy music knowledge for you there. And you just, man, you just mentioned Smashing Pumpkins record. That, that should be close on my list too. God, I love that record. I love, I love the Smashing Pumpkins, man. But yeah, that's really cool. I did not know that. It makes total sense as far as the, uh, the record sales numbers go. Yeah, because they cool. actually charged more. Like when you went out and got a regular yeah. album, it would be, I don't know, $12, $15. And sometimes you went to get a double album and it was 20, 21, 23. So it's yeah. like they accounted for the extra money that was Absolutely. in there. So I just, I had no idea. I never knew that that was the thing. Uh, what blows my mind is when that, when the wall first came out, it, mm -hmm. it actually received lukewarm reviews. It's like people didn't get it. Right. They thought it was pretentious. They thought it was bloated. And it's over huh. the years that it's it's become like a fine wine where people started to appreciate and and it's now listed on every list of the greatest albums of all time. So it's it's kind of funny how we don't appreciate things at first, or maybe we're not ready for it. Like it's ahead of its right. time. Yeah, but that's yeah. I know. Uh, yeah, I think that first tour they did where they built that wall. I don't know if uh, well that sold as well. Um, but yeah, man. Oh my god, it's. That's one of those records that my grandchildren will be discovering. You know, I guess all these albums we're talking about, especially The Wall and uh, and Rumors, are those you know for hundreds of years <laughs> those will be there. But um, yeah, man, such a great record, and uh, I, yeah, I don't know what to say about it. That's not already said. It's it's The Wall. It's just perfect. Yeah, I don't I don't know um, if this is true, but I remember at one point reading that that album coming out the wall that it was the height of payola where record labels would pay directly pay radio stations saying you know here's a hundred thousand dollars play the wall like crazy like you know that's illegal now you can't do that but yeah. i i hear that the wall was the very height where that was at its worst where they basically bought the radio play which helped a weird album like the wall become such a big hit and it's because oh, wow. it was so obvious that that's <clears throat> what was happening that because of the payola during the pink floyd wall period it became an illegal activity that you could no longer do. So I, I would have to check huh. if that is actually true. But I remember over the years hearing that that was actually a thing. Interesting. I remember always hearing those payola days. Yeah. I didn't realize it went back that, uh, that far back into the seventies, but yeah. Yeah. They could, they could, the record companies could buy their way into a, a hit single, which led to a hit album, which led them to more than recoup the initial payola. Like they were sure. paying for success, which is, uh, which is pretty sure. crazy. Uh, I actually, I was fortunate enough. Um, Roger Waters 
uh, at the start of say 2010 to 2013, he went out and played the wall in its entirety again. It became the highest grossing artist, uh, highest grossing tour of all time by a solo artist. And I was able to catch it in Toronto. Uh, were you able to ever catch Roger Waters live or David Gilmore? And usually one's doing uh, Dark Side of the Moon and what like they, they don't quite get along. So they're yeah. taking their own parts of the discography to play. Did you were you able to see them ever? I do remember Sean actually from Finger Eleven went to that show that you went and saw in Toronto. Um, I think him and his wife went. So I remember him telling me about it and being very jealous. Uh, but no, I, I didn't get to see that. He's coming back here in Detroit, um, coming up here playing in the round. So I'm going to go see that. But um, oh no, you know what? Damn, I think I just missed that too. Damn, I, you got <laughs> these shows come and go when you have kids these days. It's like, uh, it's hit and miss when I can get out and see a show, but uh, he definitely was just here. But yeah, I remember Sean saw him at the Sky Dome or Roger Center, whatever. I think that's we're called. at the same show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I remember hearing about it, but dude, so you're sitting it's... there. You're probably sitting right beside Sean Anderson at that show. Maybe, yeah. yeah. I remember, <laughs> I remember having the worst seats possible for Bruce Springsteen. So I was up in the 500. So if you've been to an arena and you've been in the nosebleeds, you know, you're at, there's 22,000 people. You're in the 300 sections and sometimes that's bad. Now double the size of the arena and be in the worst, you know, twice as far back being in the 500s. So I was that far up and I was side stage. So speakers weren't even facing me. So you couldn't even, everything was muffled. Like you actually couldn't hear it. Oh, well wow. at all so that bruce springsteen concert taught me that if you're ever at the rogers center you cannot be that far up and you have to be more center stage and learning that lesson when roger waters came by with the wall i was center and on the floor like i knew what i had to do for that concert so i took that in uh in the perfect place possible and it's uh, it was an all-time great show yeah not bad great. yeah unbelievable uh you know as you're talking right now, I just got a text because uh, I'm doing this on my cell phone. Uh, Human Kebab from uh, USS just messaged me as you were chatting there. So he must have been listening in to us talking about uh, shipwreck. He, he could feel he could feel his uh, yeah. his presence was 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 called upon. Uh, final yeah. thing about Pink Floyd, the wall. Um, I heard that the original concept for this is Pink Floyd got so big that they were their shows were so big that at one point Roger Waters was on stage and the stage was so high and the crowd was so far away that he felt like there was an invisible wall between performer and artist. There was like an invisible barrier and mm -hmm. he just, he felt like they were so big that they were no longer connected to the audience that they were playing for. And then, so that's the start of the, him thinking about this wall and then being able to put it in for, for, you know, the human condition afterwards of a wall and, and right. isolation and loneliness and mental health and all those things. So I've heard that well, that's I, the start of that concept, but I would have to. I get that. that. Some, when people ask me about playing, um, you know, big festivals and stuff with a hundred thousand people or whatever it would be. Um, when I was just out there in Europe with Chris Daughtry a few months ago, th those festivals were like 90,000 people uh, a show. And when I got back here, I hadn't played in quite a few years. So, you know, people around here were asking me and I was trying to like convey the idea that you can't, you know, when you're at a, on a big stage like that, especially as the drummer, the back of the stage, the size of that stage, the barricade, and then the crowd, they're so far away that, there's nothing it, you feel like there's a wall in front of you for sure. Um, the more intimidated I ever have been in my life is playing at little clubs, you know, when you can actually look at, into somebody's eyeballs staring at you. Um, so yeah, I, I get that, man, that idea of a wall. It's especially being the drummer. It's like, you know, does anybody even know I'm up here? It's just, it's just like a minuscule line of people, and uh, yeah, I, I get way more nervous playing at small clubs than I would any big stadium or anything like that. Yeah, well, you, you picture, you know, the the singer that's right up front at the edge of the stage. And even for him, there's a massive gap sometimes between him and, and the audience. And then you're a few meters back from that. So it's, it's right. there's an even bigger gap for you. Yeah, I just want to throw that in just to pretend I had anything relative to say towards a 
Roger Waters feelings on it. Oh yeah, I totally relate. I do. I that. understand. Oh yeah, I get it, bro. Yeah. yeah. 